right, well, it's good to be in the pulpit, and uh, summer's moving on real quick, and um, busy, busy time for me, busy time for Seppi as we go through all our requirements for work and so on, and uh, we've got lots of beautiful memories, of course, uh, traveling to the east coast of the United States and seeing Charleston and uh, all these nice towns and so on. Uh, there is a very busy place there. The, the, the motorway, the freeways are very busy. Lots of cars. Uh, but nice places to see. The parks there, beautiful. And the coastline, lovely. Beautiful things to see. Lots of nice birds. These uh, nice herons uh, sitting up on these trees there on the coast. And uh, if you can brave going between the trees and risk getting a bit of you know manure coming on you, uh, it's, they're beautiful, and they're constantly talking to each other and making all these sounds. Beautiful. And so we always enjoy the nature and uh, the memories, of course. You, you stay with you, you, you leave these places. The thing you remember, the things that you take with us are in terms of these nice memories, and it's a great thing to have that. Well, let's pray. Oh, God and Father, we thank Thee for this time we've got together. We ask as we open up the book of Proverbs, you anoint our minds that we can understand. We pray for the nation especially, Lord, for great leaders to be raised up. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, we're in the book of Proverbs. And um, last time we were looking at a lot of interesting things uh, to do with the scriptures. Um, and there's a lot of great ideas that come up and they touch on issues to do with the authority of the Word of God and how that we cannot even hope to be able to, to get to the bottom of wisdom, the ingredients of what makes up wisdom unless the scriptures have been kept for us. And so there's a lot of great things in there about preservation that not only is the, are the scriptures inspired, but they have been preserved. And that's the only way you can really make sense out of uh, the scriptures and what they say. If they're not preserved, you haven't got much at all. Now, we are into Proverbs 31, which of course is the last chapter. And I think this chapter really dovetails so beautifully with understanding the structure of the whole book of Proverbs. One of the great things I've really taken from this is understanding how this has been put together. I never really understood how this thing has been put together in the purposes of God. And so what I want to do is just dovetail into that. Now, um, if you look at the Companion Bible, Bullinger has some great notes on this. And if you look at the top here, uh, the words of King Lemuel for Solomon, a prince and a king. So here we have the recounting of the words of the king. But if you come down here, if you just read the scriptures in uh, verse 1, the words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him. Ah, bingo. The prophecy that his mother taught him what, my son, and what, the son of my womb, and what, the son of my vows. You know, that way in which this is introduced with the word what, it's like, what has happened? Right? It's like the expression of a concerned mother. What have you done? Yeah? This is very striking it's a very striking way of saying something it gets your attention immediately and this comes from a concerned mother now the previous chapter talks about there is a generation right that disrespects the father and the mother and there is a connection with the word of god the preservation of the word of god and the ignoring of that preserved word. It's, it's a striking thing. So we see this. But I want to show you something further about this. Um, you notice he gives a good discussion, discussion here about this. But 
King Lemuel, 2L and 4L, a king. A king, which is 2L or 4L, for God. A king that's supposed to be for God. The words of King Lemuel, this king who is supposed to be for God. Right? He's supposed to be for God. He was conceived, he was born, and he was raised by a concerned mother. What? My son. What? The son of my womb. And what? The son of my vows. Oh, so this goes back to vows which are said not just in the sight of man, but also in the sight of God. Don't we want the best for our kids? Don't we want the best for them? Oh, man. But in the end, you have to face the music, friends, that our kids are separate creations. They've got their own will, man. And they're going to do what they want to do. And it's going to be a matter of whether that will is going to be constrained by the Word of God, as we read in chapter 30, right? But there's something else that I want to bring up here, and, and the notes are fantastic. Like, they, you know, many of the notes in the Companion Bible, you, you shouldn't go past them. And when they're wrong, and they are wrong, right? There are places where they're wrong. For example, you can read wrong notes in Romans chapter 16. And the reason why they're wrong in there is because that portion of the Companion Bible was put together before Bullinger came to the great realization of the prison ministry, the distinctive prison ministry of the Apostle Paul. And that, that's because things went a bit faulty there. But we're not going to throw the Bible, that is the companion Bible, away simply because you've got a few, few things wrong. A lot of this is something you need to consider. So I want to show you something. And this is the structure the structure of the book as a whole. This is what we began with so many months ago. And, you know, you got A, B, down to A again. And you notice at the top, A, the words of the wise for Solomon, for a prince and a king. And then down here, A, the words of Agur and the words of Lemuel, for Solomon, for a prince and a king, my son, etc. Down here, the mother, the mother. Very strong connections here. Now, as it begins, as the book of Proverbs begins, you get these first nine chapters, which are all about this. Big warnings for Solomon. Massive warnings for him. And if we just go down a little bit more, this is in the beginning chapters. Notice the placement of the women. Right? Wisdom's call. That's one, wo that's one woman that man Solomon needed to listen to right to the end. Unfortunately, he did not. He did not. And then there's the foreign woman. Wisdom's call. 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 The foolish woman. Do uh, you see a bit of a prog progression here? There's a bit of a progression going on here, friends. And unfortunately, what we find in the person of Solomon is a degradation in his own personal faith and his obedience. You say, what? Yeah. Read on, my friends. Read on. 1 Kings 11, 4-8. Watch the progression. This is the influence of multiplying wives. This is the influence of listening to the foreign woman. Instead of listening to the godly woman. Kochma. For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God as was the heart of David, his father. You know, the word perfect comes up in the New Testament. Be perfect, even as your father, which is in heaven, is perfect. Understanding, listening to Kokhmah, 
listening to the wisdom of God. That's where it comes about, right? For Solomon went after, what? How far can someone fall? How far can a believer fall? For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. And man, when you talk about the abomination of these strange tribes and countries, you've got to understand that people would do some of the worst possible things to their own children, to these gods. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and went not fully after the Lord. Not, notice the word, not fully, not fully. Yeah, had a bit right, but started going the wrong direction. Not completely, but yeah. How far did he go? Then did Solomon build a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, and the hill that is before Jerusalem. Took it right before Jerusalem. And for Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon. And likewise did he for all his did he for all his strange wives which burnt incense and sacrificed unto their gods. This is Solomon. Do you understand how far you can go down? Can you understand how what a huge influence a person and in leadership can have with the people he's supposed to rule over when he does not listen to lady wisdom and goes after all kinds of strange women. In other words, the strange women is now a great picture of the falling away to the foolish women. And over here, if you look at uh, chapter 31, the one that we're in now, notice from verses 10 to 31, what do we have here? Now we have the picture of the model woman. Is there anything that just happens in this Bible by happenstance? Can't you see the magnificent structure that there is in this book? And here, what you have is from 10 to 22, you have her husband, her occupation, her character and bounty, her household, herself, and then her husband, her occupation, her character, her household, herself, within. This is chapter, uh, verses 10 to 31 of chapter 31. Now there's something else here. There's something going on. There is an acrostic going on. And it's an acrostic. It's a very big lesson to me personally very big lesson and it's a part of my own education which at the moment is lacking which I'm going to fix I've got to fix it and God through the scriptures really spoke to me about this look at this an acrostic let me just have show you this if you look I know it's a bit tiny but if you look at verse 10 and you go down right down to verse 31 you look at the first letters the first letters of the beginning of each of these verses, right? There's, of course, 22, but they are in order. The Hebrew alphabet. <laughs> it's an acrostic that's taken directly out of the Hebrew alphabet. And you can see, starting from Aleph, and then going right to Tav. And each verse beginning, specially chosen words, such that the beginning letter was the first letter in order of the Hebrew alphabet. Huh? Well, if there's an acrostic like that, it teaches me something. 22, it's not 26. It's not the English alphabet. It's the Hebrew. And it's taking the order of a Hebrew alphabet and the meanings that come from that Hebrew arrangement. It's an acrostic that only matches the Hebrew. In other words, 
I believe this is a good indication why it is important for people who want to dig into the Scriptures. I'm talking about the Old Testament Scripture. To get into Hebrew. Understand the language of Hebrew. And really get into that. So just circling the, you can see as you go down the letters in order of the book of Hebrews. Uh, the brother, the Hebrew alphabet. Go across to chapter 31 with me now. And let's just read together the verses as we go to verse 3. Give not thy strength unto women, nor thy ways to that which destroyeth kings. Now, Lemuel, for God, the king who is supposed to be for God. Solomon was the firstborn son of Bathsheba. It's on the cards, therefore, that these words now are, in fact, here, the prophecy that his mother taught him. It's on the cards, and I'm not saying that it's absolutely 100% known to be true, but it certainly is a possibility that these are, in fact, the prophecy that was given to Solomon through Bathsheba. And going down here in verse 3, Give not thy strength unto women, nor the way, thy ways to that which destroyeth kings. What did Solomon do? He did exactly that, and he gave way to strange women, his wives. It's not for kings, O Lemuel. It is not for kings to drink wine. Oh, okay, why not? Well, there's obvious reasons, right? For a king not to drink wine. Because they will disconnect their consciousness and their intelligence from the environment in which they live. They will no longer be capable of making good decisions. Nor for, for princes strong drink. Lest they drink and forget the law. And pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. They cannot produce good judgment. They cannot be involved with the consciousness of what God is saying to them. Give strong drink. But look here as a useful strong drink. Give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish. We do such things today. Maybe not uh, wine or strong drink as we know drink. But a type of um, medicine, medicine is given to people who are ready to perish. Morphine and things like this are given. And wine unto those that be of heavy hearts. Let him drink and forget his poverty and remember his misery no more. And even in this usage, this legitimate usage of wine and strong drink, you can see the effect of it. What is it? Forget his reality, right? He's no longer in touch with his reality. Same with those that are perishing. You give them this and they're no longer in touch with their reality of perishing. And that's in, in its context a, a, a valuable use of this. But for a king to take it under normal circumstances is to remove his ability to make good judgment and consider the law. Now look at verse 8. Open thy mouth for the dumb and the cause of all such as are appointed to destruction. Look at their cause. Open thy mouth, judge righteously, and plead the cause of the poor and needy. Unfortunately, near the end, Solomon lost all that. Was, get, was given to a very bad example. The destruction of the family. The destruction of the nation. Now comes verse 10. And you notice, starting here with Aleph. Is it written in your Bible? Do you see an Aleph next to it? Nothing? In the Companion Bible, it's got the Aleph is put next to it. Who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies? Yeah, you, Solomon, you went after the strange women. You looked at the flesh and you gave yourself to this weakness and as a consequence, you've been deceived. Who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies? The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her. Well, 
Solomon couldn't trust in these strange women. Not in reality. So that he shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. Here is the example that goes against the bad example of the strange women. And the foolish women. And the apostate women. She seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hand. Worketh willingly. Not for show, not for vainglory, but because it's right to do. You might say, well, what's a good example of this kind of virtuous woman? The one who's totally moral. And by the way, if you read the, read the notes uh, by Bullinger, he talks about this virtuous woman. It goes much further than that. This deeply moral woman. And... Who would be a good example of this? Well, the only real good example I can find that would fit this bill almost perfectly as you read through here would be Ruth. Ruth is it, right? Ruth the Moabitess. Isn't that interesting, right? Ruth the Moabitess. And yet here is a woman who is a strange woman in a technical sense but shows the other side. Someone says, I'm going to make your God my God. Where you go, I will go. You know, beautiful example. And it goes down in verse 13. She seeketh wool and flax and worketh will willingly with her hands. She is like the merchant's ship. She bringeth her food from afar. Well, this doesn't look like a woman who's just sitting around all day watching TV and soap operas. You know what I'm saying? Not doing her nails all day long, right? There's nothing wrong with having good nails. But she's doing some other things here, right? She rise, riseth also while it is yet night, and giveth meat to her household, and a portion to her maidens. A portion to her maidens. Oh, wait a minute. She, she's not without influence. She's got maidens. Hmm. So this is not some, you know, uppity person of big money and all she wants to do is just sort of drive around in her Porsche you know <laughs> no no she's out hard work caring for her maidens she considereth a field and buyeth it wow industrious man this is a woman who's a businesswoman in our common vernacular right with the fruit of her hand she planted the vineyard the fruit of her hands this is not someone that doesn't get dirty with her hands she gets down there and does the business she she girdeth her loins with strength and strengthen of her arms <laughs> she perceiveth that her merchandise is good her candle goeth not out by night wow good example of wisdom here good example of a wise woman she layeth her hands to the spindle and her hands hold the distaff man she's on one of these things have you seen how they do wool and spin stuff yarn and they make stuff she stretches out her hand to the poor yea she reacheth forth her hands to the needy she's not selfish she's considering other people all the way through here she is not afraid to the, of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. She maketh herself coverings of tapestry, her clothing is silk and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. She maketh fine linen and selleth it, and delivereth girdles unto the merchant. She strength and honor are her clothing. Oh, look at this. Isn't this beautiful? Strength and honor. She means she's got all these other clothes. But her real clothes are strength and honor. And she shall rejoice in the time to come. The time to come. There's rejoicing. She's going to die. She's going to grow old and die. But there's coming a resurrection. She opened her mouth with wisdom and her tongue is the law of kindness. She looketh well to the ways of her household and eateth not the bread of idleness. No, 
She's not idle. That's very clear from the readings. Her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praiseth her. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain. But a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Don't these words speak? Eh? And let's face it. You can look at all the beauties of a sunset and all of these things. Let's be honest. A beautiful woman is a sight, isn't she? A beautiful woman. She is a sight. For all of us, men and women, women and men appreciate a beautiful woman. But look what's stated here. But a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands, and let her own works praise her in the gates. This is the place that the gates, where the discussions are made, where judgments are made. There her name will come up as an example. As an example. This is how this book must end. It must be the personification of, of Lady Kokuma, right here. It must be the example that Solomon must see. He must see this example of the woman that he should have been faithful to and should have married instead of being pulled aside by all these strange women and the terrible example that he made in his fall. We can learn a lot from this, my friends. A beautiful book, man. The book of Proverbs. I'm so glad we studied this. It's been a personal blessing to me. It's been encouragement to me. I now really have got my eyes set on what I need to do in, my, in terms of my own study. And I've got to do it. It's got to happen. Let us pray. Our God and Father, we thank Thee for this book that has been written so many years ago. So many involved with writing it, the scribes, the wise, and Solomon, and yet preserved and inspired. We thank thee for it in Christ's name. Amen.